Hi everyone, welcome to Dave's Bonsai. On today's episode, PSGF. Now you might be asking, what in the world does Dave mean by PSGF? Well, I'll tell you, passive solar green frame. I've been doing a lot of research over the last couple of years into a passive solar greenhouse and all the things that make it work. And I figured I could make one of those in my backyard to enhance my bonsai. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe anybody has created a passive solar green frame which is a combination of a passive solar greenhouse and the cold frames that I've been doing for the last several years with my bonsai. So why in the world would I want one of these contraptions? There's all kinds of reasons. Now, first and foremost, growing bonsai trees in Minnesota is a challenge simply because the weather. So what can a bonsai enthusiast do when they live in the upper Midwest or even north of us in Canada or Alaska, Mr. Bald Yeti? Yeah. We don't have much growing season, do we? I could move. There's plenty of places in the country I could move, or the world for that matter. I could build a bigger cold frame. The one in the garage got bigger. This one could get bigger. Better yet, I could build myself a PSGF, otherwise known as a passive solar green frame. This PSGF is gonna combine all the pros, I hope, of both a greenhouse and a cold frame. So the greenhouses, one of the biggest struggles we have with greenhouses is the heat because even in the winter time with a greenhouse, like Nigel Saunders has witnessed, you can get the temperatures up at the top of that greenhouse well up into the 80s and 90s and sometimes over the hundreds when you're talking Fahrenheit. We've had rain in Minnesota in January, rain in February. Now those are cloudy days, but if we get a 40, 45 degree day in January or February and I have a greenhouse, it's just gonna get really, really hot. So we wanna be able to control and regulate those temperatures the best we can. And I hope the PSGF is gonna be the answer. I, of course, have a lot of trees in my yard and a lot of trees to protect in the winter time. And now I'm starting to house some plants for some clients. So I have to have the room and I have to have good conditions to keep the trees. With all the snow in Minnesota and the cold, we have to try to keep the cold frames really, really regulated at that 35 to 45 degree range. I've done that in the past in my cabin and my garage cold frames with my heaters on a thermostat regulated heat source. So when it dipped below 35, 32 degrees, it would go on for a little bit and warm that cabin cold frame and the garage cold frame right back up. Not only do I need bigger and more space for the trees, I also have to still maintain regulation of temperatures. I believe regulated temperatures is the biggest thing that I'm concerned about with this PSGF. And that's what I'm striving for, as much regulated temperatures, all natural, because it's a greenhouse. And I'm gonna use the sun to power the heat source if I even need the heat source. And what is the heat source? It's the ground. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I need to keep my temperatures in the winter time 35 to 45 degrees, hovering around 40 would be perfect. My dream, of course, is to own a plot of land and grow a whole bunch of trees outside, but then also to build a bigger structure, kind of a workshop for bonsai, a greenhouse or a green frame or the passive solar green frame to uh, keep the trees in good shape when it's winter time and in summertime, of course, with the Minnesota climate going up and down like a roller coaster regulated temperature. So that's my dream, the big piece of land, a big greenhouse I can walk in. Now I've been researching this for a good couple of years now and I think I'm ready to build my passive solar green frame in my backyard. It all had to start with convincing my wife to build this. That took a couple of years. She's on board, we're ready to go, as long as I make it really nice to look at. <laughs> so now that I have that, I had to find a location in my yard. While taking off some holiday lights earlier this spring, I was up on top of my roof and took an aerial shot of my garden and of my backyard. So as you look down at the yard, over on the left side by the cabin cold frame was where I was hoping to build the PSGF, over by the upper pond there. And so that position probably would receive a little bit more sun than the position we ended up going with. The next option was the right side of the yard when you're looking down from the top of the house over by the big Colorado blue spruce, where my second bonsai bench is. 
Now that spot might not get quite as much sun, but in the end, what I have to balance is too much sun and not enough sun for both seasons. Now, of course, in the middle of winter, I want as much sun as possible, but in the middle of summer, the greenhouses get so hot, there'll probably be no trees in there. Now, the trick is to balance the hot and the cold and the amount of sun in your position of your greenhouse. So most of the passive solar greenhouse research that I've done has been through a guy and a company called uh, Verge Permaculture. So I've gotten into a little bit of research on passive solar greenhouses through Rob Avis. So Rob Avis, who is up in uh, Canada, used to, with his wife, be an engineer and working on, I believe, oil rigs or, or something in the oil industry. And they just got out of that business and then they want to be more self-sustaining people. And that's where permaculture comes in. You can research permaculture, pretty fascinating stuff. Basically, permaculture, the way I understand it, is people who can kind of self-sustain their life as best as possible and not have to rely on other people uh, throughout uh, their daily lives with food and everything. I was really only interested in the greenhouse portion because they do build a lot of those and they have a lot of great examples online. So I purchased their permaculture passive solar greenhouse program to learn how I could build mine accurately and make sure I had enough of the right flow of air and uh, engineering to make this possible. So a lot of research there. Check out Rob Avis in Verge Permaculture. I'll have links of course at the bottom in the description area. And so when you're building these greenhouses, most of us believe that we put our greenhouses directly south facing. And that's okay, but for these passive solar greenhouses, we want to actually tilt the greenhouse a little bit to the left. And that's going to produce a little more morning sun than afternoon sun. And after the cold evening temperatures in the winter here in the upper Midwest, we want as much heat to accumulate as possible earlier in the day. And then in the end of the day, when it's the hottest in the greenhouse, even in winter time, we want it to not have as much sun. So we acclimate our greenhouse a little bit facing east from direct south. I am standing in front of the left option here with the cabin cold frame. So I was hoping to have it right about here. And I was talking about a 12 feet long by six feet deep passive solar green frame right here. We would lose the cabin cold frame and we would extend this out and we would have a nice uh, passive solar green frame right here. And I could tilt it a little bit to the east because of the way the garden is designed right now. Now after some back and forth debate with my wife, she didn't like this location as much as the other one. So the other side to the right, uh, we were gonna decide to build our passive solar green frame. So let's go over there and check out that spot. We moved over into the sunshine on the right side of the yard, again from the upper look of the uh, house roof. On the right side is my second bench structure that I built behind me. Now it's a little dark and underexposed over there and there's a lot of sand over there because I've been digging a hole in the ground. We'll talk about that in a second. So all of the garden here has been kind of taken away and this is where we're gonna house the greenhouse. So this is gonna be pretty much due south. We got the big old Colorado blue spruce here. So the morning sun will be blocked by a little bit of the trees and the houses here. So that's kind of unfortunate for the passive solar greenhouse concept. But again, this is a cold frame. I will have subsequent heat. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. The sun is gonna go up to right here right up above the houses and trees right over there. So there's a good stretch of time in the daytime where that solar energy is gonna come into the passive solar green frame and be able to warm up uh, the, the green frame. Now we don't want it to get too warm, so we have to be concerned about that, right? But we're gonna be circulating air so it doesn't stay too hot. And of course at night doesn't stay too cold. How are we gonna do that? Well, it's all about the, um, what they call an earth battery. We're going on geothermal uh, thermal, uh, energy. Um, so the thermal mass of, of stones, of, of earth, and keeping things relatively uh, regulated temperature-wise. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a greenhouse, but we're going to put that greenhouse on top of an earth battery, or they call it a GAT system. Um, so it's the ground air heat transfer system, GAT. And so here's the general concept, and I'm no engineer, and I'm no expert in any stretch of the imagination, but my last two years of research has brought me to this basic understanding. Because everybody's asking me, what are you digging this hole for, Dave? What's going on over here? Here's the basic of the GAT, or the basic of the passive solar greenhouse. We're gonna take the air from underneath the ground and we're gonna bring it up into the greenhouse when we need warmth. And when we need warmth out of the greenhouse, green frame, we're gonna take the heat out of the green frame and put it down into the earth. So you need to dig a really big hole 
and you should be four to five feet below depending upon what part of the country or world you're in because the permafrost up north in Duluth might be 36 to 48 inches down. Here in the metro, probably not past 36 inches. So I'm four to five feet down here with this hole because there's gonna be tubes down there and that's gonna be where all the air goes through. It's gonna go down this side, go down into the tubes, cross over and go up this side. And from the solar power on the roof of the passive solar green frame, it's gonna collect enough energy to house some, some energy and store that energy. And then when the fan has to kick on based on thermostat regulated uh, power source, if it's below a certain temperature, the fan's gonna kick on and it's gonna bring up some of that warmer air underground. If you've ever been spelunking, okay, maybe just in a cave, one of the tourist locations, if you've ever been down there, you wear long sleeves and long pants if you, if you have them because even though it's summer outside and 80 degrees, down in the caves, it's always between 45 and 55 degrees in most parts of the country. So the earth down below too here, again, depending upon where you are, for me, is probably gonna be between 40 and 45 degrees all the time, spring, winter, summer, fall. So we're gonna utilize that really powerful thermal mass regulated heat to kind of keep things regulated. So we're gonna build ourselves a passive solar green frame. So more information on the passive solar green frame throughout this series. This is part one and I've gotta show you how it all began. It all began when I had to find that perfect spot to put the 12 by six uh, passive solar green frame. And then I had to save all of the plants from underneath the Colorado blue spruce and all the plants that were in the garden where the green frame was gonna be. And I had to move those in different parts of the yard and start digging the hole. So sit back, take a sip of tea and watch. Well, Tom can take a sip of tea. You guys can all join him if you'd like and watch a little bit of me just a little crazy. Now, as you start to watch the speeded up version, of course, of me digging this massive hole, people ask me as well, why don't you get a little bobcat or, or uh, some kind of digger you can use, backhoe, you know. I dug this hole completely by hand. So really the tough part is over. Making the shape was the hardest part because we had the black dirt, um, roots, plants that we had to sort out, roots we try to throw away. And then I put all the dirt over back by the uh, new sodded area. We're gonna seed some grass there because we had a lot of big, big indents with roots. And so that's going over there. So all of this right here was the shape, kind of about 13 by seven for an eventual 12 by six uh, cold frame greenhouse, passive solar green frame. And so right now is kind of the easy yet hard part because now we can dig down as you can see, the change in color. So I've got all the black dirt over for the seed area, and now it's just sand and rocks. So it's usually pretty easy to dig with the sand portions, but we hit a lot of rocks. So a lot of work ahead of us. So we're gonna dig out a, another layer or two today and then take a break because this definitely need, just needs stages or I'm gonna kill myself. So all the way around the uh, 13 by seven ish, soon to be past the solar green frame, 
I got another shovel depth at least down lower. I left this shelf in here so I can come up and easily get into the wheelbarrow so we can continue our piles back underneath the pine tree. It is the moment of truth. Tape measure is out. It's extended beyond two feet, but I'm hoping for about one and a half. Two feet, I put a big smile on my face. Let's check it out. There's two feet. Yeah, we're more like 16 to 17-ish. I use the toss method. I use wheelbarrows. I use buckets climbing up ladders to get up and down and to remove all this soil. Again, 12 feet long, six feet wide, five feet deep. We have a lot of sand in our area. So once you get below that six to 12 inches of dirt and all the root structure and it's a really strong earth, everything below it is sand. I know that because of digging into my pond structures in the past, but I also was very concerned about cave-ins where the, was the earth gonna just kinda unsettle it? So if I had any weight here with machinery, would I cave in this thing and make a massive sinkhole? So I decided to do it all by hand. Hey everyone, I'm a couple of weeks into the project and as you can probably tell, I'm now standing in a hole. If, you, if I tilt the camera up there, there is the uh, bench that's still there. Not very much here. And I'm in the hole. So last night we had rain finally after a good week plus without without rain it's been a tough tough couple of weeks but we got deluged with the rain so my biggest concern was this was i gonna have that happen so the hole is about where i need to get it to start putting the footings in however i have to deal with this Okay, so it's not the worst thing in the world because I was at about a solid six feet wide by, or 12 feet wide by six feet deep with the hole. And I need to be a little bit bigger than six feet, a little bit bigger than 12 feet for me to fit the footings in the way I want them to be. So it's gonna provide the safety and security for the structure that's gonna be on after the footings. So I had to do a little trimming on the sides and back of this. I was just gonna do it with the shovel and slowly and real methodically, uh, but the rain did it for me. So now I have to get all of this out of here. And the problem with this is, is if you can all tell, I'm about five feet in the ground now, you know, five to five and a half feet in some spots. And look it up there. Yeah, that's the top of the big pile of sand. And so that's at seven or eight feet. So I'm hoisting the, yeah, I, it's really a hard work. And so I'm so close to the end, so like I wanna be done but I still have to take my time, do it right, make sure nothing else collapses, nothing else is gonna cause problems. So it's a nice cool day, breezy, but I'm in the hole, no wind, good for filming. And let's get this dirt and sand out of this hole and start to prep it for the footings day, which is just around the corner. Yeah, taking a break. That's a lot of dirt, a lot of sand, throwing it really high. More to do. I belong to Planet Fitness, and I just didn't go there for the last three or four weeks because I've been using my muscles, carrying 50, 60 pounds of sand with buckets and shoveling and yeah, body aches and all. We've got a hole now that is 12 feet wide, six feet, wide, uh, six feet in, in, in depth, and five feet down to the ground. So super challenging, but I did it. It's 7.45 in the morning on footings day, and I'm really excited to have Toby over here to get the footing started. However, last night when I took one final pier into the hole to see how close I thought we were ready for the footings, I'll just have to show you. Another small collapse. The hole keeps getting bigger, which is good. 
I think the footing frame is going to fit in here. But we keep losing some of the uh, hole. And I've got the birdhouse there that I didn't want to disturb. And that's the last piece that fell down. The birdhouse is still there. Let's hope we don't disturb. But we might in the end have to take it out. Time to climb back in and get a few more buckets of sand out of the hole. I've been waiting for this moment for quite a long time. Um, we are at the point now where we get to start mixing cement. So I'm in the pit. You know, it's great down here. We love the regulated temperature. That's why we're making a PSGF, passive solar green frame. And so the first stage is the foundation. Toby's been here for the last couple of hours. We've had a couple of slides. Toby put all the rebar in. We've got the frame in here. It's relatively level, maybe a few taps here and there as we go, but it's time to mix some cement. This is super exciting. I'm not quite sure if we have enough cement bags to, well, I'm pretty sure we don't. So I'm gonna have to get some more cement bags. So we're gonna do as much as we can now. Then I have an errand to run for about a half an hour or so. I'll get some more cement bags and we'll continue. Um, let's just get to it. We've got some cement to do, some more back baking work. We got the water, we got the cement, we got the uh, mixing uh, trowels, and we have the uh, everything we need. Let's just get going. So after the hole was dug, then I had to make my foundations. Cause see, we're gonna build a brick wall here. It's like we're making a basement, but we're not gonna live in it. Sand is gonna come back in here, some pebbles and stone and the tubes, and we're gonna cover this hole right back up like it never even existed. But after the hole was dug, I had to put these in. So there's a sneak peek of the finished product of the foundations. I had Toby's help on that and listen to this everybody, we used 63 bags of cement, 60 pounds a piece, from the store to the driveway, down here, into the hole, and cut open, and 63 bags of cement. I'm feeling pretty uh, proud of myself and without Toby's help of course it would have taken so much longer and him and I working together was fantastic. So here we are. 12 feet long, six feet wide, and five feet deep, and the foundation is in place. So again, in summary, I am building a passive solar green frame. So the air from up in the cold frame, or greenhouse, because it's both, when it gets hot and it gets too warm, the fans will kick on from the power that's supplied by the sun, and it's gonna send that air down into the ground. And when it goes down into the ground, it's going to add already to a temperature that's about uh, 40 to 50 degrees, probably hovering between 40 and 45. That's my guess. I'll put some sensors down there and we'll be able to get some of that data as well. Um, but we're going to have that air get a little bit warmer and it's going to cling to the uh, thermal mass properties of dirt, um, of some of the uh, gravel that I'll put on top of the tubes. It's just going to stay relatively stable temperature and get a little bit warmer and then at night when it drops below freezing the fans will kick on again and that 40 45 degree temperature maybe as high as 50 some days will slowly come up and circulate back into the cold frame and it'll make sure that we don't dip below freezing and of course if all else fails if it just can't support keeping it above freezing 
I will have a secondary little ceramic heater in the cold frame powered again by the sun if need be. If it gets below 32, that will kick on for just minutes a day. But again, promoted by the sun and no other uh, on-grid system. So we have the whole dug, we have the foundations. Part two is gonna be building the brick wall, putting all the insulation and the dirt in, and we'll tell you what all that stuff is for in the next one. This brings part one to an end. We've got the beginning. Part one was the hole and the foundation, and it is complete. So we're gonna move on to part two. I hope you join me on this journey. It's gonna be a blast, and a lot of people who have heard me talking about this concept are getting really interested and curious on how this is all gonna work. Are there pros? Absolutely. Are there cons? Absolutely. We're gonna talk about those as we go through this process and in this first year of experimentation. After talking with Nigel Saunders in the Bonsai Zone in his greenhouse and seeing his trees wake up so much earlier, it was just more exciting for me to know that I was building my green frame, my PSGF this year. And so the things we have to worry about is the trees waking up early. But I'm gonna worry about that when that time comes. We're generally gonna to try to keep our trees protected like we would in any other situation. And we'll have to learn uh, the bumps along the way. But hey, until those new episodes, and part two, three, and four, or however many we have, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your bonsai, and we'll catch you on the next one.